Well, they crack the doors around quarter after seven, and then uh, breakfast is then between then and eight, and you lock up for just like five, ten minutes or whatever, then they call work release, usually around ten after, quarter after eight. It goes till uh, 11.30, and then uh, everyone goes back to the ranges, they lock up, they count. Around 12, we start serving the meals. Again, around, you lock up after the meals, so around quarter after one, they have another work release, which goes to uh, 4, 4.30. And again, they lock you up, and then that's, they make you stand up to count, make sure you're still kicking and stuff like that. Around five, they, that's when they start supper. So everybody goes through that, and then uh, exercise is quarter after, or quarter to seven. To 8.30, then you have a changeover, you can go to the gym, or go from the gym to the yard, or wherever you want to go within the joint, until uh, 9.30. Then you lock up at 11, and then you're locked up until the next day, it all starts over again. My name is Brian. My name is Douglas Brown. Uh, my name is uh, Dennis Malcolm. Um, I'm 33. I was sentenced to life 25 for first degree murder. I'm uh, serving a life sentence for domestic violence. My name is Jamie Pallette. I'm 27 years old. I'm serving a life 18 sentence for second degree murder. I was sentenced and convicted of first degree murder in 1998. I was arrested and convicted in the year 2000. I'm 25 years old. Uh, I've been here for 17 years. I'm not eligible for another five years. My first eligibility date is 2011. And my possible release date is 2024, October. With the Lifers Group, I'm chairman um, or president, whatever handle the, the guys put to it. Um, I basically just chair the group. Um, the guys have voted me in. Um, when I was here before, I, I had been chairman for, for a number of years or whatever and um, always kept the group going in a positive direction and uh, keeping things afloat and stuff like that. So the guys, when I came back, have, uh, have asked me to uh, assume the position again. And so we voted and the guys elected me in as chairman of the group. Okay, so. Because of the way the group has, has functioned over the years, um, that it's been formed and stuff like that, um, because of the precedence that it has been set, that we do make sure that nothing happens down here, that you know, it's, a, it's a safe environment, um, it's, uh, if you would say, it's a, a legal activity, free environment kind of thing. Can you maybe tell us about the life room specifically? Like, um, if somebody just was in here for robbery, can they come down to this room? Um, no, unless there's a, a specific invitation given to the guys, um, it's it's basically just four guys doing life sentence. It's not every guy that's doing a short sentence really doesn't care too much about what's going on long term. Um, but what we find is that a lot of the lifers or whatever care about this room, uh, make sure that there's nothing that happens down here that's not supposed to happen. Um, we know what it's like to, to have this room. Whereas a guy that's just doing a few months and he'll be back on the street or a couple of years, he'll be back on the street. For him to, to screw up down here and lose this room or whatever is nothing to him. So what, what we find is that uh, a lot of lifers or whatever value this and um, realize its, its value. Can you tell us about these fish tanks, these nice big fish tanks that we see around? Um, yeah, they, uh, they've been built by the lifers. Um, I actually took part in building some of them. Um, we, uh, it's, it's money that we've like, spent on our own. Um, the institution hasn't paid for, for any of, of the things you see down here in the lifers room. Um, and it just gives uh, the guys an opportunity to, to be able to take care of something and it uh, just gives them something to look forward to uh, and it's, it's nice and peaceful. It gives us a nice little uh, quiet, tranquil uh, atmosphere uh, down here. Right? So it's, uh, we try to encourage uh, the guys to, to take part in taking care of the fish. Um, we have little baby fish that are around and fish that breed and stuff like that. A lot of books to, uh, for the guys to read up on and, and stuff like that to care for them properly. But. Are any of these fish tanks around here your, like, do you look after any of them or you're not into the fish as much? Oh, yeah, I got this one. Um, this one, well, that's a baby tank. And that one, they're trying to get some things happening there, but they're not cooperating, so. But this the, one's mine there, the sharks. 
hopefully won't be taken as this is just a lap of luxury and um, we're not doing hard time and stuff. We have a nice uh, fish tank to take care of and a nice pool table and a nice room to come down to. Um, we still got to do this day in and day out for, uh, for many, many years. This isn't, uh, you know, um, easy time. This isn't somewhere where we're just kicking back and saying, ah, what a joke. Um, yeah, you know, some might think that at the beginning or whatever and look around and say, geez, you know, but after uh, day to day and every day, uh, it's, uh, it's not easy time. It's not uh, kicking back. Uh, we're doing our time and, uh, and trying to, to do things that are going to keep us functioning and, um, you know, going in a positive direction. Eh? So. In regards to image, like uh, sometimes I've talked to the media on a few occasions already. I can't say uh, that it's, it's good to live here. Like it's, we all, I guess basically all, all we do here is we, we try and get along together. But I don't like to talk about, uh, well, we have a TV here, we have a fish tank here, because I don't want the people to, to know those things. Uh, especially, again, going back to the young people. I don't want them to come here and feel more at home. As a matter of fact, five years ago, we invited a group of kids down here. Oh, they were all happy because we had video games and we were cranking up the stereo and uh, we made a mistake by bringing them down here. It was too, uh, they felt more, more at home down here than just an open room upstairs or whatever. So, in regards to what the community thinks, well, I mean, it's, I wouldn't argue with them, I wouldn't argue with them, it's their point of view. But we're still human, you can talk to us, we, mistake, we made mistakes in our life. And I think most of us are working on it. You know, we want, uh, we want to evolve in society ourselves. Eventually we're going to end up there. If you had to describe prison life in one word, how would you describe it? Um, Part, part of me would say boring because it's, it seems like you're always waiting for something but you don't know what you're waiting for. Monot it's very monotonous and it's the same thing every day, every day. And can you describe maybe some of the feelings that you felt the first time you came here because you're pretty new to the prison system I guess when you first came. Yeah, I, it was so. crazy. You, come, you pull up and there's those guards with the guns up there. It's, it's not good. Yeah. yeah. You don't know what you're walking into kind of a thing. So in terms of the fear that somebody would associate with prison, you weren't scared when you first came in here? Oh, naturally. Naturally. Uh, first initial thought, I mean, you drive up, you see the place, and I mean, it looks pretty freaky. Yeah. So it's, it's an initial fear, but w once I came inside the institution and I realized how many people that I knew in here, it didn't bother me. But I mean, of course, naturally, it's it can be a violent place if if stuff happens. So yes, it is a scary place to live once in a while. I mean, imagine yourself, 300 to 500 of the worst violent offenders. You have lifers, you have aggravated assaults, you have sexual assaults, you have every charge under the book inside the one institution, one place, everybody living under the same roof. So for the amount of violent offenders that are here, and for the actual ma amount of violence that happens, it's pretty low. I mean, the, the, as, as soon as society or people on the street hear about a lockdown, that's, that's all they hear about the institutions. All lockdown, the guys in Stoney are acting up again. So I mean, the violence is very low, considering the people that are doing time here. Um, is there anything that scares you here? Before, but now it's like, it's just something, it's like everyday things, it's, you know what I mean? So it's not something variable when you're walking around, or it's just whatever. You just kind of get uh, immune or desensitized, I guess you'd say, to the everything. But at the same time, it's not as, like, it's not as bad as what's portrayed out there. I guess if you had a chance to demystify prison life for somebody who has no idea, 
what would you say that the biggest Be misconception best, is? Best description, look around your campus, look around your community, look around the small town. That's what this place is. It, it's, a prison is a society. A prison has its own society. It has its own governments, meaning like the guards and uh, unit managers, the uh, correctional supervisors, the wardens, everything. So everything's in place for a small society. Like in terms of your freedom, like that's what I'm interested in, the fact that like you've had that taken away from you and that's something that most people on the outside take for granted. Like, is there anything you have to say about that or would you even know what you're going to do? Oh, I would know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you do? What would be the first thing? I don't know. It'd just be cool to walk down the street and go to the store or something. I mean, anything would be cool. It'd be all right. When you get it, you know, for me, when you, like, from being arrested, it's like, that's when I was awake, kind of a thing, because everything you think about, what am I doing Friday, blah, blah, blah. It's right. all thinking back then, so it's like, that's when I was awake, and when I got arrested, now I'm just in this, like, dreamlike trance kind of a thing, where it's, it's happening, but it's not, it's... Right. Maybe a way to deal or something. I don't know what it is, but it seems to work. So. Mm -hmm. And I guess you don't really have to think sometimes because like everything is told you to go at this place at a certain time and lunch is at this time. Oh yeah, like that kind of stuff. That's all. You don't have to think about all that. But because all that happens during the day, but then once eleven o'clock comes, you're locked in there, your little cage by yourself, and it's that's when you, your mind starts thinking and stuff like that, and it's so it all comes back. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about like? an actual prison cell, like what like the, the measurements are, what you're allowed in there, what you're not allowed, do you know? Uh, six by eight. With your TV, you, if, you, if you can afford a TV, like most everybody has TVs, but you have TV, you can have a stereo, like a fan, a lamp. And that's all stuff that you paid? Yeah, yeah, you gotta buy it all yourself and stuff. So. If you do artwork or hobbies, you can most of the stuff you can have it in there. It depends. Some tools they don't let guys bring back to their cells, so it's for security, I guess. So. And can you block off? Like, is there any way to sort of get yourself privacy in the cell to block it off? Uh, well, they got like a a curtain, bed sheet kind of a thing you can put up, and then it's got a hole in it. You're not supposed to block the the hole, but everybody does. Just throws a jacket in front of it or whatever. But yeah, it's. You get privacy, but it's not like a closed, solid door or anything like that, so. Since I've come to jail, uh, I did a lot of, lot of work for myself. I, uh, when I first came in, I, uh, I really wanted to know what the problem was. I thought that I wasn't that bad after all, even though I took a life and all that. I, uh, so I had to do a lot of research. Why, uh, why all these things happened. I didn't want to use them as excuses, but I wanted to see what happened, what I can do to change, to feel better. So it helped me start doing my time. So while I've been here, I've always been working. I've never been unemployed. I've always worked as an inmate. I, uh, I guess I'm a model inmate. I don't really have too many charges. I don't, I don't think I have any serious charges as an inmate after all these years. I've never been in the hole. So basically I've kind of, I follow the laws of the institution. I guess, which I didn't really go on the street. That's another, that's another thing. I didn't really respect the law. Because of, uh, because I just wasn't thinking. I just wasn't thinking. I thought life was so easy. Nice car here. Girlfriend here, drinking. That's, that's my life. Was that's what I believe. That's why I'm sitting here today. We've uh, started up a Candace Dirksen fund. Um, Candace is um, a young girl that was murdered in the city um, a number of years ago. Um, her mom, Wilma Dirksen, um, is, is a lady that uh, has been working with and for the victims of homicide and stuff like that. 
Um, she came in here and we did um, some one-on-ones and um, a basically a, a face-to-face meeting with um, victims of uh, homicide. The people that work with um, Roma and around Roma and Roma herself that, that basically dictates on who gets what and, and that kind of stuff. We have, uh, the only thing that we wanted to make sure was there's some people out there um, that would love to see <coughs> to crucify us and to see us locked away forever and that kind of stuff. And they focus a lot of their time and their energy on trying to keep us locked up forever kind of thing. Um, sometimes a little too much and, and not focusing on the victims themselves and stuff like that. So what we had, the only, the only clause I guess that we put in there was that it would be used for the victims and not for any victims like right advocacy. like. Um, I don't know if you'd put it that way, but you know what I mean? So that it, it's, it's, yeah, like for counseling for them and you know what I mean? Anything that they actually need and stuff. Um, not like there's enough people that are fighting to keep us in for forever and life is life and that kind of stuff. Um, we wanted it to, uh, to be used for uh, the victims themselves, eh, for whatever they need. And after that, we, we have nothing to, to do with how it's, you know, handed out and stuff like that. Can you tell us a bit about your involvement with the Lifeline program? Well, with the Lifeline program, uh, well, it's uh, Remy Roche and Carl Maitwashing that work there. And uh, I've been living around for years. Uh, I guess I wasn't really involved in the Lifers group early in my sentence. But uh, the last few years, five or six years, I've been really uh, involved. And in, uh, as a matter of fact, I think about five years ago, I became chairman of the Lifers group. And uh, so I was. I had to work closely with Lifeline because they were the directors of uh, Life was in Stony And so, what did you? What were some of the things that you had to do as the chairman? Well, uh, at the time uh, we used to have weekly meetings, which we won't have now. But we used to have weekly meetings and just basically uh, look after uh, the meetings. And we used to have charity events quite regularly, which we won't really have now because of the, the changes in the system have affected us as lifers. Changed, but uh, maintain our life as own. We need rules and regulations, so it was my job to maintain that stuff. Can you tell me how old you are? I'm 60 years old. You're 60. Yeah. Wow. And how long have you been involved with the Lifeline program? Ten years now. I'm in my tenth years. All the Lifeline program started in Ontario in 1991. And uh, there was two uh, lifers on the pro who were doing the job I'm doing. And uh, I started in 1994, and then the one who had started the program passed away in 1996. And I became the leader of the program for across the country uh, in 1996. And uh, when I started, we were three worker. Now we are 26 across the country where we have lifers or long-term offenders on parole who are going back inside of every penitentiary every day to work with men and women serving life in prison. Can you tell us a little bit about your involvement? The first criteria to be involved is you have to be either a lifer or a long-term offender in the community for a minimum of five years. Then you can be allowed to come back when you apply for the job and if you are accepted by the non-profit organization who are having the contract in each province, then the first criteria is to be an ex-offender. So right now, I guess your status with the LIFER program is, you're not the chairman anymore? Or are you? Uh, because of the, like uh, I was nominated for uh, Inmate Welfare Committee to represent the population. So I, t I took on that position and I had to let this one go. So. Can you tell us a bit about that? I know you showed me your Daybook, you have a lot of activities that you do. You well, it's kind of a somewhat of a stress, somewhat of a stressful job. It's uh, I deal with the administration, I deal with the warden, mm -hmm. uh, I deal with inmates, and uh, it could be any any concern they have. It could be problems, serious problems, it could be minor problems. 
Sometimes I have to talk to a pool officer. We just uh, help and resolve issues between staff and inmates or inmates to inmates. So my job is very difficult. What would be, without getting into details, what would be some of the tougher problems that you have to do? Well, sometimes it's, uh, say, in regards to your, your analysis program, a lot of times it's just a misunderstanding on the inmate. Like maybe it was you never got the paperwork in time or stuff like that. So just making the clarification on how the... And being the IAC or Inmate Welfare Committee inmate, I'm very aware of what the Commissioner Directives are. Commissioner our Directives are rules of in the institution here. They're not rights, but we have to follow them. And there's ways the administration has to follow them. So sometimes you have to understand. So an inmate won't understand them. So I'm the one that explains to him, well, this is what I say, like I'm entitled to three pants. So if you have four pants, they can take one away from you. Just, just an example. Right. So do you find that the inmates are tend to listen to you more because, like, you're not sort of like an authority, like sort of somebody from the outside telling them what to do, like somebody who works at the prison, that they can understand you better because you've seen both sides. I believe I make my own calls, and I get a lot of respect for that. Uh, yeah, as from inmates, that's why I'm in the committee. At one time, I was going to step down, but. Because the respected inmates ask me, I have to stay on because there's really nobody else right now. So, uh, but it's a learning experience for me personally. You know, I, I used to be a person where I didn't talk, probably be hiding in the bedroom when somebody walked in the house. Today I'm able to speak, I can chair meetings, I can whatever, just do things and I didn't do before. Tell me a bit about your family. What about them? Ah, they're, they're family. I mean, they've been an excellent support for me, especially my sister. My sister and my mother have stuck by me since day one on this. And they know I, I messed up and I did a choice, but that can't be changed. But still, I mean, they're, they're behind me. Right. So you talked to them on the phone and whatnot? Yes. When was yes. the last time you talked to your mom and your sister? My mom would have been two nights ago and my sister last night. I have a picture of my kids. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. And how old are they? Four and seven. And when was the last time you saw them? Um, just uh, about a month and a half ago at a uh, yard social. We have um, children's socials, um, family day socials here uh, in Stoney. And uh, I was able to spend the day with them out in, uh, in the yard. Um, we uh, bring in clowns and ponies and stuff like that so that uh, uh, it's somewhat of a friendly atmosphere. I know they're young now, but if you ever had to like lock up a message to or, of advice or or something to to tell them in ten years from now, is there anything you'd say? Or you, you know? oh, it, do you have enough tape? Um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't have uh, just a couple words of advice. It's yeah, it's basically just going to be sitting and being able to to what little interaction I have with them, trying to uh, steer them clear of places like this and mistakes that I've made and stuff like that. Eh? Um, yeah, that's, it would take, I think, a little longer than we have. Yeah. Eh, so. Where do you see your life, like, maybe 10, 15 years down the road when you finally get out of here and you're, you've already done the escorted temporary absences and you're more on the parole and you're, you actually can start a life outside of Stone Mountain? What do you see yourself doing and where do you see yourself? Well, I guess it's a, it's a difficult uh, question to answer because you don't want to plan too far ahead when you're doing a life sentence. Uh, but still, uh, the parole board asked me this question, and they said, what's, what's, your, what's your future plans? So I told my my biggest dream someday is uh, to go to my kid's house and have a meal with them. That's, that'd be the priority. But eventually, if I get released to the community, I'd like to work with my own people, maybe get into uh, some kind of, maybe work as a counselor, or uh, help out in other areas of uh, Aboriginal issues. I think it's a message I give to young people. On occasion, a young guy will come to me and ask me what they should do about themselves or they're having problems. So that's the message I give them, you know. There's an opportunity to do something about yourself. There's school here, there's programs here. Take them seriously, you know what I mean? Maybe learn something that you can use on the street. I guess uh, all the things I've said, hopefully somebody can learn from there for the better. I 
don't really like talking to the media, but the reason I talk to the media is uh, to help somebody, to help somebody else. I hope somebody learns from my mistakes. And if I ever get out something, I thought I'd like to convey to the community. Mm -hmm.